Welcome, everybody. You've, you are at How to Facilitate Presentations of Learning. Um, and really, it's virtual presentations of learning. We're going to talk about that towards the end. Uh, my name is Matt, as Rachel just shared. I uh, am an eighth grade math science teacher and also uh, work with the professional learning team at the High Tech High Graduate School of Ed. And I am just introducing the other facilitators, and I'm going to help with some tech and chat room. So if we could go to the next slide with norms as people are entering. Um, I know a lot of you have probably been on uh, other workshops today, but we'll just review some of these norms that are very important for us today. Um, just make sure you remain on mute uh, unless you're speaking. We have a group of about 30 right now, but we'll be getting into some small group and then you're, you can unmute when that happens. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to chat at any time. We have a couple of us here that are gonna be looking at the chat on the right. Um, it, to access that, you look right down below in the middle of the screen and you'll see the chat bubble. Uh, I would recommend keeping that open throughout this time so that you could see comments and it's also where you're going to access a couple of the documents. And remember, nonverbal signals are very important, but um, the facilitators won't really be able to see you. So I'll be able to check in uh, if anybody has questions with that. But uh, another way to give some feedback is if you click participants, it gives you an ability to raise hand that's right below the list of names. You could raise your hand that way, or you could just chat if you have that question. Um, another great thing is to use reactions down below. That's where you can give a thumbs up uh, with sharing your ideas. And then if possible, remain on video just so that we can see that. But um, you know, that's, you know, when we talk to our students, not all, not all students want to share their backgrounds and everything. So that's something we, we don't, don't require. Um, to start, if you could, in the chat window, please write what you teach and where you're from, or any, and maybe anything else you'd like to share at this time. We'll take just a minute to do that as more people are entering. One more time in the chat window, what you teach and where you're from. Welcome everyone. Sorry, I have to like, I have to like zoom in on my face to read. <laughs> Make her space. A lot, a lot of people from San Diego, LA. Arcata, oh, way up north. Way up north. Love it. Love it. All over. Uh, all right, I'm going to give it away to David and Rachel and let them introduce themselves. All right. For the next slide. I'm trying to find that. There we go. <laughs> David, go for it. Yeah. Um, yes, that is my wife and I. We are at brunch. Um, I am David Smith, eighth grade art teacher at High Tech Middle Media Arts. Uh, one thing that I do appreciate about what I do is that I'm an art teacher first. Oh, no, excuse me. I'm an artist first, and then and I'm an art teacher as well. I've been teaching uh, High Tech High for 12 years. This is my 14th year in education, and I am proud, and I'm loving it. Take it away, Mr. Rachel. Thank you, David. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rachel Nichols, and the photo with me is my mom, who was a career special education teacher. Uh, I've taught for 10 years in PBL, and prior to that, I taught at a variety of schools. Um, but the reason I always bring my mom kind of in with me is that, like all of us, we always think about the whole student and not our content area. So I think most of the stuff you hear today is about, in, in terms of presentations of learning, is about talking to a human being. Um, and we're really excited that you came. It's four o'clock. Um, super appreciate you being here. So Matt, and, since you already introduced yourself, shall we continue yeah. on or would you like another crack yeah. at and it? Just to share, there might, might be a couple other people from high tech chime in with um, info, but I've been at high tech for 15 years too and um, work in a lot of ways if people have questions. Take it away, Rachel. All right. So here's our agenda for the day for, for the next probably 30 minutes, really. Um, we're going to talk about why do we do POLs, what they are, logistics of doing them online, which is different. Um, we'll give you some POL prep questions, um, and then think about what are your next steps and how are you going to prototype? So today, when you walk away from this, you're going to have some things in hand to move forward with. That's the hope anyway. You'll let us know if we hit that and uh, hopefully, uh, and ask questions at any point. 
David, this is you. All right, so here, here we're gonna watch an example of a POL uh, that we've been doing for a couple of years where students were asked to tell a story. Um, and in this story, we wanted them to elaborate on one aspect, either through eighth grade or through middle school. When I say aspect within the journey, is it freedom? Is it fear? Is it uh, uh, survival? What is it? And that's what um, these presentations uh, were. They had to be three to five minutes. And this is an example of one. And this is an introvert, by the way. And so after you out. watch this, we're going to ask you to attend to some questions. So after this, you're going to come together and think about some questions. Here we go. Oh, it didn't oh. work. No way. So let's see. Uh, let me try this one more time. There we go. Excuse me. As I came into eighth grade, I decided to fully commit to our newly founded all girls travel hockey team. The previous year, I had played for both the girls team and a co-ed team. This year was going to be different. I was going to focus and work as hard as I could so that I could be the best player possible. Throughout the year, I learned many different things that would help me on the ice and off. In November 2018, our team was offered to play in an all-girls tournament in Detroit, Michigan. This was a big opportunity. As soon as we arrived, I got a really bad cold and couldn't speak because my throat was so sore. I wanted to go back home, but I knew my team needed me. I pushed through for all four games, and even though we didn't win, we were a team and we were all accountable. This taught me about being there for my teammates and peers, no matter what. At school, we worked on various group projects like the dream job and the dream car. And I remember to do my part and always finish the things I was given. After the Detroit tournament, my team was disappointed. We didn't win a single game in the tournament, and we were on a losing streak in the regular season. My coach brought us together and told us to believe in ourselves. He told us about how great hockey players have lost so many times before they finally won the Stanley Cup, the hmm. Olympic medal. We raised our heads high and made a plan to work harder and harder. My dad always tells me that practice makes perfect, so that's what we did. We went to extra clinics and ice time, practiced shooting off ice, and skated more than ever during practice. By the end of the year, we were placing in the top eight of the Scott Hop into the Bracket. bracket. More importantly, we were going to districts. All of the top girls hockey teams from our district compete in a big tournament to go to national. Because we had worked so hard during the season, we were offered a spot to play in Alaska for the district tournament. We lost in the semifinals, but we still played the best game of our whole season, and we got to travel across the country because mm. of it. Hockey has taught me to work hard for what I want. I worked so hard to be the player I am now, and I know that school will be the same. High school is going to take a lot of work. Just like going to Alaska, I'm going to have to practice math and English problems for the SAT. I'm going to have to keep getting better in order to go to college. This year, I practiced for weeks before our state tests, and now I feel really good about my scores. The combination of hockey and middle school has helped me so much in preparation of high school. I've learned to persevere, be accountable, and have commitment. I have become a leader of my team and during group projects. I now know I need to stop second guessing myself because an idea or chance is better than no chance at all. I know I can face the struggles of high school because I faced the struggles of this year and overcome them. I believe in myself. Awesome. David, do you want to say a couple words about um, POL and just what the T and the I mean, and then we'll go to the next section? Yes. So typically, you know, you have your POL, your presentation of learning. Um, and then for this one, because this was their last one of the year before they moved on to the next level, which is from eighth grade to high school, which is uh, the T stands for transitional. Um, so yeah, this one was like almost like an ethic, ethic as it interview um, into going into high school or just like their proof of why they're ready. So yeah, T is for transitional. Uh, I, I, POL, 
and, and uh, that that stands for an internship pol thank so you, thank you. so we can use presentations of learning for many many different things mm -hmm. um, but when it's specific to an internship for instance at the junior year they spend a month out doing internships and before they come back to school they do a presentation of learning specifically about their internship a transitional uh, presentation of learning is about the transition between grades or movement toward uh, a different grade or something like that. So you could use a POL um, to get it information in any way, um, but to kind of ask students about a particular experience or particular, for instance, with the internship, um, they take on different looks depending on how you want to use them. All right, so if we could go to the next slide, what we're gonna have you do is you'll go into breakout rooms in a moment and with a partner, answer one of five questions. So if you, it'd be great to talk about as much as you can between each other. Um, right now in the chat box, you just were shared a set of slides called breakout room slides. So if you open that up, um, you'll see that it gives you a set of blank slides essentially with numbers on it. When you go into a breakout room, you'll actually see a number for the breakout room uh, associated with you and your partner. So um, what we'd like you to do is discuss anything from that video that you can. Uh, think about what did you learn from the student? What did you think this video um, made the student feel? How did you feel? And then really, we want to hope to get into the semantics of POLs a little bit deeper so that you could think about structures for your own POL at the, at the end of this. All right, so yeah. make sure that you have these slides and you don't wanna confuse them. You also had the whole presentation slides shared with you at the very top of the chat. So if you did wanna open that up, you can also, but there's slides you could add to this. It and says we wanna share permission for the slides. I don't know. We gotta make it public. These ones. All right. Um, there we go. And done. Um, thank you. I was going to say, if anybody has difficult accessing, it's totally fine to put your comments in the chat and whatnot too. But thanks for sharing that. The, um, we should have permission now. Okay, sweet. So it's good now. And feel free to put that in the slide, in you know, in the slide uh, or the chat. All right. Let's begin breaking out and you'll have about six minutes. If you look at my screen, I'll put up the actual time up here that you could reference, but um, you'll be able to keep track with the slide too. All right, go for it. Matt, I'm not in a breakout room, am I? Because I can't see that uh, if I am. You shouldn't be, but I'm going to be entering one. So. Okay. No, no, no uh, worries. I just want to make sure I'm not leaving somebody stranded. Yeah. No, I was just managing that right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So a couple of breakout rooms have three people because the numbers are not exactly okay. even. Cool. Um, um, should I go to this breakout room five, cool. Randy, or is it possible to, to change that? Uh, right now, there's two people in breakout room five. If you, okay. If you so sorry, but not yet. Yeah. I'm looking for anywhere there's um, just, just one fine. person. Great. Thank so you. there's only one person in breakout room one. Do you want me to move you in there? Uh, if needed, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. We're I can do it. On a few people, maybe some of these folks. So I'm. I'm sure we have, I, I actually can't see the, um, I can only see a couple things on my screen, but I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions and folks wanting to share out. And unfortunately we have a limited time. Is Matt, are you still on? I am and I'll, um, I'm gonna address a couple questions that came up in a little bit, um, but I think it, it would be appropriate to go on and then we'll get those questions as they relate. Fantastic. So I think the most important thing and it's easiest to forget, um, when we, when we start thinking about school, which is our product is people, always, 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 and that students are the center of your work. And when you move from there, then it makes all of the stuff that you're about to see obvious, right? You're probably doing it all the time anyway. 
but a presentation of learning really puts them at the center of like, what have I learned and why did I learn it and how did I learn it? So this is the, the easiest way to explain it. The what, it's a time to really talk about growth and learning in front of a panel. So it ups the ante. How did they learn things or how do you do it? They present in formal presentations and, you, and whether you're in person with people or whether you're online with people, that doesn't change. You have an audience in front of people and you let them talk about something important to them. How do they do it? Well, they share artifacts. What is it that they can prove that they've done? So you've noticed in the video, the young person shared um, lots of pictures and video, but that could be a math problem. None of these have to look the same. Um, but we do need to see the artifacts so that students themselves can see, wow, I did that. Why do we do them? Um, because they serve as a passage presentation. And in, in, in some cases, the transition of, um, transition of learning shows I'm ready for the next step. It shows their readiness. And they have to own then that they're ready to move on because they've proven it or they've attempted to prove it. We have a great question in the chat. Does a student ever not present readiness to move on to the next level? And what does one do in that case? What do you want to chime in? Excellent. Yeah, we, we don't, not every student passes a presentation of learning, but just like in real life, we give them another opportunity to do it. So we help students once they present. And if they fall short, we'll talk to them, we'll coach them up, we'll allow them to um, correct and then they come back and do it again. Because the that's really the important point is they just usually didn't know how to do it. Um, in basketball, for instance, you wouldn't fail somebody because they miss a free throw. You're the coach. So what do you do? You give them some advice and let them shoot again. Hope that's a helpful answer. And again, I apologize in advance, we're having to fly through this, but we're just, think of this as um, an appetizer and you can dig deeper um, when you have a chance to kind of look at this and then think through your own work at the end of this presentation, you're going to be creating kind of your own format for a POL. But when you look at this slide here, what a POL tries to do is get right in here between products and experiences, knowledge, skills, and disposition and processes. And what we want to know is kind of right in here. How did all of these things kind of come together? Where did you struggle? Where did you succeed? And where are you now? So when you think of the design process down here, right, it's in this ugliness that we want to know what happened to you and what did you learn about yourself? And that presentation of learning really allows the student to give you a full picture of what their learning was like. They all learned something. It just may not be exactly the thing that traditionally a test would ask for. Um, and this is taken, there's a really great book called Hands and Minds, A Guide to Project-Based Learning. And this is taken, um, from that book, which is great. If you don't have it, I highly recommend it. But neuroscience chimes in on this. Why do we do it? Because it increases, when students talk about their work, it increases the overall effectiveness of their brain processing. And it allows for active retrieval of past knowledge and assists in their retention and creative thinking. I think that's really important. Yeah, we do some things because it's kind of neat to do, but there's also a reason, a scientific reason that we do it um, because it helps students become better thinkers and learners. Um, and again, I love this book. You should get it. Just saying. Uh, and I didn't write it or anything. So now, now what's in it for students? Well, this is an example of a POL. They get to make their own decisions about what work should I share? What shows my growth? What's the evidence I could use? And this helps them be writers and thinkers. You can have a thought, but what's your evidence? They see themselves as learners. They learn to advocate for themselves. They learn to fight for something. Um, they practice having the reflective conversations that we want them to be able to have. We're building presentation skills. And this helps everybody see and appreciate the journey of learning. It demystifies and illuminates the whole process for everyone. And that's, that's ultimately what we want. We don't want anyone to be afraid to learn or afraid to engage in a topic, um, particularly students who are first gen, right? Um, if they feel like they don't belong here, well, sure they do. We just need to teach them how how and why they do, give them the language for it and the ability to fight for it. So now we're gonna talk about, if I'm going too fast, I apologize, just slow me down. I can only see what's on my screen. So. And I just wanna chime in, um, don't forget, there's a lot of great info, but there's also really good comments in the chat if people wanna just view what people are saying in that chat. Cool. Um, 
So how do we prepare for virtual POLs? Well, we need to think about what students need to do to get ready. We need to think of how we're gonna structure them. Everybody has different access. So what do we do that'll make this everybody feel included? Where do we hold them? What kind of platform? Um, how are we gonna schedule them? What works with, with the adults in the, in, the, in the, let's say adults are working. Maybe you need to schedule them in the evening, right? We, we always are thinking about what, what can we do to meet students where they are? and who will be on their panel and why. And very often we let students choose loved ones to come into their panel because who's more important to a person than somebody they love? I already know the answer. Okay, um, and this was a great article um, put out by the D School, our friends at the D School, and I've linked it at the bottom. The title is what we learned in 48 hours after about putting together online projects that don't suck. Very user friendly, but I know everybody's busy. So what I did was I went ahead and took out some of the best advice. Um, and, and you can go in and find this, but I think obviously, and we've learned this, I'm sure you've learned this in working with your students, it's very important to communicate in advance, making it possible for students to present by phone. There's no reason everybody can't do a POL. Um, offer tech check time, which is something that we've learned along the way as well. You have several people on tech committee even though normally you wouldn't have to do that. The other thing is, and this was really helpful, everything takes about 30% more time to do via video and everything feels and takes longer than you expect. So as you're planning for things, give yourself time. Um, what Stanford learned in that first two weeks that really helped them is collect work in advance. That way you can kind of anticipate in the presentation of learning where students will need help or if they need more evidence, you can ask them for more evidence. It helps the students, it helps you. And you, then you can MC it a little better or be the DJ. If you assign order ahead of time, particularly for students who are stressed or have anxiety, that's super helpful and helps the transitions of your POLs. Build in breaks, because we all need them. Um, because everybody has a clock on their, tech, on their technology, you can also ask students to keep track of their own time, which helps. And then find ways, this is the personal thing, and I thought it was a really sweet piece of advice, find ways to connect via physical objects or food, even from afar. So if you're gonna have a POL, ask everybody to bring a snack. And at break time, for fun, have everybody show, what did you bring for snack? And then you're connecting, it isn't just this like, we're, we're, you know, we're robots behind the screen, but we're human beings, we care about each other, and we all know when you break bread together, you connect. So that's one kind of simple thing that I thought was really smart um, by our friends at the D School. Finally, we're gonna have you all get to work because um, work time is very important. You have with you a bunch of smart people. And by that, I mean the teachers from around California, not necessarily the high tech ones, um, but they're all right, they're all right. Um, so what we'd love for, to kind of help you um, do is do a sample schedule for student POLs, um, either virtually or in person, whatever works for you, possibly create a rubric. And if you're thinking, what might that look like? Remember the hockey documentary. What kind of rubric do you think, not documentary, what kind of rubric do you think was given to that child to really help them have success? What kind of preparation documents might you give to your students that would help them prepare for a POL? And then how might this look? Think about a way that would work for you and your community. Um, in the next slide, there's gonna be some resources. Um, I'm not sure how we wanna move slides right now because I want you to be able to have this and work on it. Uh, Matt, do you have advice for that? Um, I think we'll keep this up so that people can both access the, well, the four points that they might wanna pre prepare for. But if you wanna open the slides, they've been shared with you in the chat a couple times. Um, you'll be able to see all the resources from that. So remember, this is just about 10 minutes that we'll have work time to think of you, probably one of these items and then uh, spend some time asking and answering questions about those resources and, and giving feedback. So yeah, we weren't gonna break out people in groups. You can work in the big session if that helps um, because that would just be easiest and you can put it on your computer, you can write it down on a piece of paper, you can have a conversation or a chat conversation, whatever you need right now. It's completely user friendly. Do you know from my so, oops. 
Um, and I think it's going to be useful because we'll hopefully get a lot of questions to start getting those questions into the chat and all of us um, that are here from high tech can help to answer those. Yeah. One last thing, if you are working right now to create any type of draft or prototype for a system that you might use yourself, we're going to send out a quick form that lets you uh, volunteer to join um, a tuning protocol on Friday morning if you'd like to get some critical feedback on it. And we're also going oh, to send, uh, oh. send out, not her, she's staying with me. We're also going to send out a uh, invitation to an exhibition oh. where you can share this work on Friday at one. And you can make it one of the PBL project cards that get shares with, shared with the whole group. All right, I'm going to turn my mic off and find out what this person would like. You just want to be on camera, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> she's so cute. All right. Ask questions and, and get to work. A lot can of um, you to check this out. Can I address what Miss Jessica was asking earlier? Oh yeah. Just just uh um you mentioned like, you know, for example, what if a student like picked difficulty as like a, a as like a theme? Um we had one student who talked about um how they made like scratch kind of paintings as like their catharsis. So they made a bunch. Um and then put those like almost like their POL was like a gallery. So they emptied out my room or emptied out a wall, put all their pieces up and for the POL they presented those pieces and their journey through each piece as it's like kind of own um its own like thinking space. Um, instead of doing a video. And it's because we had that open freedom, it was a beautiful POL and the paintings were, were amazing. You know, it was one that was scary and we had more questions, but with with the students like input, we were able to get through that specific piece and, and you know made me feel safer over like, oh, woo. but um you know it's, it's it's those moments where it's like okay like you took it and ran with it mm -hmm. um yeah awesome thank you so much yeah yeah i'm really curious about that where students will make things difficult for themselves <laughs> i think the other element is um for everyone is the panel's pretty important so you have a panel and what the panel is kind of supposed to do is help you along. So if you've, if you've, let's say you made a video and then we're going to talk about that video. If there's some holes where you thought, Ooh, there's no evidence there. They didn't really talk about this thing. Panelists can ask you, for instance, uh, okay, we made that video. Is there anything um, that you would add to that video that would elaborate on your learning in blank? Or is there anything missing that you'd like for us to know? and they can address that. And I, I would say a big um, thing to think about with that panel is who are the people that gave critique through the process and to make sure they're on it so they know that process. And then if there's stakeholders outside of school, you know, that contributed to a project. So I always think of who the expert is to be able to have them be part of that POL too. Do we have more questions? All right. Let me make these public. I'm going to block my face. I feel like my face is everywhere. And it could also be great just to share ideas you have in the chat if you don't want to put something fully together just right now in this time. I have another idea that I did last year. Is that okay if I share? I don't want to share the air. Um, as a practice POL, the, the last art project before POLs, I had students uh, do art documentaries. So they had to do an art piece and literally do like a time lapse in their journey through that piece. And it was to gear them up on, you know, how to use tech, how to speak, um, um, you know, I don't know, the uh, phone camera. Um, whatever, and then I can coach them through that. So by the time POLs came, our kids were super comfortable because um, they've had a month and a half before the actual POLs to kind of do an art doc. It was just, you know, it's my way of like practicing. I didn't know how to, we, we give them all this, this stuff to do and it's like, all right, they need a practice run. So that was my idea. 
Um, on the question of how do we select the panels, um, one thing that I asked students very regularly to do um, was to choose from various menus of people. And they just had to select a certain number of people from each category. So a category would be peers. Another category would be um, other adults at our school whose opinion you respect. Another category would be family or community members and so on. And then for different elements or different events in class, they would choose different people from those categories. And actually we did those very often digitally as well. Um, we would have students maintain blogs of their progress or digital portfolio pages. And then when they made their choices of who they were selecting for their panel, what they were actually doing was sending an email with their work to those people and asking for those people to write an email back to them, which is certainly something that hopefully we can try now. <laughs> Somebody asked the question about how do we schedule the POLs um, and right now that's a really great question because we're trying to figure out like where people are in terms of access. So for us at the high school level anyway to try to schedule something maybe during the traditional school day would seem not smart, not user friendly um, because most of our children have siblings at home so we don't know is there one computer for 10 people are there you know so i think being smart about scheduling them is usually we'll take a week we'll know this is pol week and then we sort of work through like okay we give give them a menu of time where they can sign up they, they and their families can sign up so some sessions maybe in the morning some be maybe in the afternoon and then some in the evening um, but you try to give as much flexibility on when they can sign up. Uh, and then you just sort of work around that. I hope that helps. Yeah, to go a little bit deeper with that menu of time, we usually do that in a shared Google Doc and then with my team and then also send a survey out. So I know we're going to plan to send a survey around tech and tech scaffolds and then have that people just first come, first serve, fill in the, the slots. Um, I know also know of other people using Calendly. It's it's free for widespread use in education right now, um, but that might change. So, um, now might be a great time, uh, Rachel, if you want to share the last couple or walk through those resources. In the last couple slides. Sure. One of the really cool things about doing these online is that you can invite a hundred people if you want, which uh -huh. for us was problematic, but now you can jump kind of from meeting to meeting, which is nice. Um, okay, so next steps. Obviously, you're thinking about what you want to reflect and, or, sorry, think about this question. I think, what are questions that you have regarding POLs that we can address here and now? Um, so think about that and reflect, and then I'm gonna get through these. Here are some excellent resources. Um, which include rubrics from POLs if you'd like them. Um, there's tools and videos below. Um, and then, let's see, we'll ha we have examples of POLs. If you'd like to see some of the examples from all over the place, that's for you to do and look at at your, and then, yeah, Randy, please, yes send that um you want to yeah so there's lots of um resources to do it once you decide but the most important things i would i'm just going to take you back a couple of slides because i think before you before getting there i think this is really important is to think about um this think about the need how where etc sketch it out in your brain and then sort of problem solve as you're working through these questions. Right. As we finish up, I know some people will be having to go pretty soon. Um, thank you so much for joining. Randy's going to be sending out a survey in the chat. Um, and we want to make sure that you can bring ideas for POLs into that tuning and other aspects of projects uh, later in the week. Um, closing thoughts and then we're going to be staying on for questions too. So we're here for any questions and um, if you want us to walk through the resources more. And before everybody goes, 
yeah, I'm just so impressed and grateful that folks are showing up. Um, in this time, it's been really hard for all of us to be away from students. And, and here you are at a four o'clock, um, always trying to do what's best for students. And I find that for me very inspiring as a teacher. So thank you for being here. Seriously, thank you. Yay. It's a beautiful day. I have a talk. Oh, I want to share with you. As I represent parents, and I listen to you, help me to uh, give ideas how parents can support students in home to make possible the presentations. And uh, I'm thinking about the bilingual presentations. Uh, uh, with teachers that are monolingual and parents that are just speak one language, how can we work with that? Do you have any idea uh, how parents can support a student in home? Maybe uh, they can watch in another device the presentation in another room of the home it would be better than stay in the same room of the student. And is the teacher can talk to parents in advance. Because uh, it's hard for the students when you're all day in home with the siblings um, running around. <laughs> 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 then I think it's that will be great idea if the teachers uh, contact parents before the presentations. And um, uh, given uh, what they expect and what the parents can expect and how can support the student. Yeah, I would, I would definitely second that. I think that idea of that they may make in the article about preparing everything beforehand, that way you know what you, needs to be translated prior to the POL especially and, and have the translation clear and have teachers on board to translate that, help translate that is, is really essential. That's great. And also, we've had students um, before act as translators, which is mm -hmm. pretty neat. Um, so I think your question is so outstanding, though, which is such yeah. a great question. Yeah. Feel free to ask any questions as, you, as you're exploring. What's the name of the workshop survey, Randy? Uh, this is facilitating online um, virtual yeah. presentations of learning. I'm double checking the survey. I hope I didn't make a mistake in it right now. Okay. That happens sometimes. And by the way, in terms of POLs, though we we've, we've done them for a long time, we ad ad adjust and adapt all the time. Every year, mine looks different. Every yep. year you get better at it. Every year, yep. depending on the group in front of you, you have to make, you know, you do what's, you do, you teach for the people in your room and you do POLs for the people in your room and families in your room. So you adjust according to, you have basically a framework, which is the framework is we're going to ask students questions and we're going to have them make decisions about their learning. But beyond that, you get to design it um, based on, what you feel is right yeah. and so so every time that changes so start small look for feedback ask folks um how it's going and then adjust i mean sometimes we adjust by the hour not the times you can't do that to families <laughs> but you know you you just realize if things are working or or they aren't working yeah sorry about that please refresh the survey <laughs> I just added the option in the drop down menu. And if you, if you haven't accessed it yet, it's um, it was sent at 446 by Randy in the chat. Cool. Yeah, I can put that back in again. I can put the link in. We are living and learning through this time. And part of that is how fast you can actually fix things on a computer. It's kind of amazing. Yep.
But I think it's really sweet too. I'm guessing it was around the time that your own child came into the room. And, you know, we can imagine these very human things are happening all the time to all of us. So when we talk about student work and the advice that Stanford gave, which was everything takes longer because, you know, in a home, what we're, what most of us are, we caretake for somebody. And that includes our, our students too. So from the middle of a presentation of learning, and somebody needs a little attention, you know, it's, it's Sophie's choice kind of, right? Like you have to attend to the person with the greatest need. And so, you know, um, I it's think- It's not as bad as the actual Sophie's choice. No, no, of course, but right, you know, you, there's this <laughs> pressure of life. Here are good. <laughs> right, right, no, but, but for children could feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna fail. And yet, yeah. you know, if somebody needs them or, you know, so mm-hmm. it's trying to make human what feels not human, Mm -hmm. which is doing things through a computer screen. It's the juxtaposition, right? Or the the sort of. All right, we're gonna stay on and answer questions and do everything we can to help. And we'll keep the comedy rolling as well. Um, And, you know, now that we're in a day and age when even family interactions end with end meeting, um, if you, if you want to just uh, return to your life at home, that is totally fine. We'll, we're going to stick around, but feel free. When you feel like you've gotten um, what you need, we, we're, we're ready to dismiss you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Is, uh, Greg, are you still there? Greg? He's asking some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. This group gets smaller for the bigger group. It's fine also if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions that way. Well, uh, I want to answer Greg's question as far as um, um, uh, a POL. Yes, we we, we had had um, had, had, uh, POLs at the end of uh, each semester. So semester one and then the, the big one, the juicy one at the end of semester two before the year is over. Um, but as far as like a, 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 a unit, um, I feel like, yes, you can have a smaller version as an assessment kind of tool. Um, but yeah, I feel like it, it's, it's nice to have the kind of bigger stage because I feel like kids show up and, and they're accountable and they hold themselves accountable and they, they're at their best kind of when that pressure is kind of put on. Yeah, I hear you, but we're since we I, I've not done this for the kids. The last time they uh-huh. did any kind of presentation was uh-huh. back in September when uh, the first assignment was go buy a computer, and they did groups of four. So this POL would be a individual, uh, b not in, not as much time, right? Because I gave them two weeks, a team of four, uh-huh. and it's been a while, right? And so uh-huh. to throw, I, I, I'm more interested in okay what you know i mean i could say what did you learn since january um mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll probably get answers all over the map right gotcha uh, some will understand unit two and unit five and some will say well i kind of just uh did what he did <laughs> yeah see and i'm wondering i'm wondering if there's beauty in that uh mr greg like what what have you learned since january and then kind of sub kind of categorize that like what have you learned about collaboration since January what have you learned about yourself what have you learned about the difference between west coast rain and then west coast sunshine going from 63 to 85 in two days like you know like I'm wondering you know I'm wondering if you can like sub categorize that because yes you can have the broad one which you're going to get some great answers and some great feedback and then the kids who need that more scaffolding you know it, it's yes there. most, it most of my kids I've got about 3% that don't need scaffolding. They're 97 ah. do because ah. uh, they're mm. not, they're, their presentation skills are weak to be nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and of course, like you said, if you make it high stakes, I, I don't know if you, yeah. you do this in lieu of a final. I like to yeah. do them in lieu of a final, but because we really didn't cover the ground, right? Basically, we've been out since middle of March. Yeah. Uh, I think it would be unfair. So I would, I would like to do one just to get uh-huh. them to get one more, because I, I really believe in soft skills like this POL. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I do it anyway, uh, mm-hmm. but I probably don't want to have it as high stakes. I probably just want to say, okay, the last two units, maybe, you know, not since January, 
uh, yeah. you know, tell me about what you learned, right? What do you, where, where, where are your strengths? Where's your weaknesses? Um, yeah. What would you talk, tell the student coming into class next year? That kind of thing, right? Exactly. And I, I would, I would highly encourage you to push it. That way you can use it for your own feedback, how you can make it better for the next time you do it. I say, go for it. But that's yeah. Cause we still have five weeks. It's yeah. not impossible. You know, I'll have to give them like three days. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just knock off some, some other stuff and then, um, you know, do that like three days before final and say, okay, here's your option, right? You do a POL and if you do it yeah. well, I'll, I'll knock off the final. So that way I'll get, cause some will just, I don't know about you, but my um, attendance is yeah. down to 60%. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's about, it's about that. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not going to get a hundred percent. I can't make it the final because I'm not going to get a hundred percent. Exactly. Right? And so I, I can make it weighted um, a good yeah. chunk and say, you can do this or the final. And then the people that don't do a POL, okay, yeah. you're taking a test. Yeah. Well, and, uh, I think you bring up a great point of where we're at right now too, with, um, you know, attendance issues that come up with virtual um, stuff. And the, the fact that a presentation is sharing with people that they might, you know, um, care sees their work is a great way to get all work in. Like we're seeing the more that we could assign work that gets feedback from their peers, the, the better. So it's just another mm -hmm. way to share learning. And, you know, if we're just saying it's going to go to the teacher and that's it, we're, a lot of teachers, I think, are not getting a lot submitted, but mine, mine are the opposite. They're like, "You're embarrassing us," because mm -hmm. I like to put stuff on Padlet, and so I teach computer science, and I put it up on Padlet, and every so often, I'm like, "Okay, let's play so and so's game or so and so's podcast or so and so's project," and they know they don't have it right, and so they're embarrassed. Like, no, this is good. You don't have all yeah. the pieces, and I try you know, and go through it. It's like, yeah, he's got the wrong answer, but look how he starts, right? Look how he's broken down the problem. He's got this right. He's got this right. Yeah, at the end of the day, he's got the wrong answer, but he's made, you know, solid progress. But they're all worried about, oh, it's not perfect, right? And that's that's where they get all, they get take umbrage. You're like, oh, it's not perfect. And I'm like, yeah, it's not perfect. You're learning. If you had it perfect, you'd be teaching the class. <laughs> exactly. I think one yeah. thing that also like jump in and add there is um, there are, there are content specific presentations of learning. There are lots of good examples of them. Um, people who are earning their PhDs do a content specific presentation sure. of learning, right. To like right. at the presentation of their thesis, et cetera. Um, but, and that can work at this point, but an, one thing that I've kept in mind or sort of learned over the years was that asking heavy content specific uh, questions sometimes divided the students into like ones who were like, I'm going to participate or that's not for me. Sometimes it divided the panel also in that the panel didn't know how to interact so well with um, really specific elements of academic content. Whereas the experience of being in a class or the experience of, of learning and doing things, everyone had an experience. So that was something that everyone could talk about and adults in the room could have their own feelings about you know, how individuals manage different experiences. It, th th that question um, of like, or that prompt of help illuminate your experience or help me understand your experience, that um, it, was a, it was a bigger net. It, 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 it brought more people in. And it's not like we didn't have a time or space for the content specific stuff, it's just that that wasn't always the like the big transitional presentation of learning because we would try to answer those questions in the right venue for that sort of a thing. Um, and I do think that's important that students should, they, they should be presenting their content in the, in the venue, in the format where they're receiving that type of expert feedback. Um, and then this opens up different, different types of um, conversations to happen. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay. So I could I could have basically two 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 prongs, right? One be content based and one learning experiential based. Yeah. I, like I mean that. everyone has an experience. So 